Welcome back to the Smarter Marketer Podcast, brought to you by Rocket Agency. I'm your host, James Lawrence. Welcome back to the Smarter Marketer Podcast. I'm here today with Joe Alder. Joe, welcome to the pod. Thanks. Good to be here. Good to have you here, mate. So Joe is currently head of SEO at Rocket, which means that he he essentially owns the SEO product in the agency. So that means our approach to SEO, our philosophy on it. He manages our team and he also um, manages SEO strategy on um, certain key Rocket accounts. Throughout his career, Joe has worked on SEO for brands like Amazon, Kudos, p and Cruises, PE Nation, Fujitsu, Coats, and many, many more, both big and small. So I thought um, a really good opportunity to catch up with Joe and just talk SEO as he's seeing it, as we're seeing it, um, what is working, what's not working. And we thought a really, a good place to start would be just a discussion on why SEO. Because I think a lot of listeners to the pod will have varying, I guess, varying degrees of um, importance that they place on SEO for their businesses. So Joe, I guess um, we're chatting prior to recording but just the, the why of SEO as we get to, um, you know, the end of 24, beginning of 25, in terms of um, being a traffic lever, um, what, what are you seeing out there in terms of how the, the, um, the industry and the market's changing? Yeah, so I actually think SEO is growing, if anything. Um, I think one of the big ways you can see that is in recruitment. Like if you look in Australia alone at the moment, there's 2,000 jobs that have SEO as part of the description. I think, yeah, recruiting SEO is one of the always been a bigger challenge, but it's, it's getting increasingly harder. I think if you look at the data as well, although some of Google's traffic share has declined slightly because of AI search engines like ChatGPT, et cetera, the actual overall searches are only increasing and more and more people are coming to search engines to look for those terms. I think on the kind of data and trust side as well, um, Google or, or SEO has a highest trust factor. So if you look at conversion rates between channels such as PPC, SEO in general has about two times of the conversion rate, so double, but then in some more competitive niches such as finance or in SEO, what we would call your money, your life, mm. it can be as high as seven times the conversion rate. So I think, yeah, people are trusting SEO a lot more than they would trust in other channels. And, mm. and it is a big driver for these competitive businesses. Yeah, it's totally true, I think, because I probably speak to more prospective clients, I think, and just being out and about in the industry and they're not everyone. And I think often non-marketers, there is this kind of, oh, is SEO as important as it once was? And the data that we see like says that it is, I was like, I was in preparing for the pod. Um, there's kind of a few big data points. There's a bright edge study, which is English speaking world. So I think it's heavily like America, Australia, Canada, UK, Ireland, and on average, 53% of traffic driven to sites each day comes from organic search. Um, and I think direct is like 20. So it gets up to like three quarters of traffic is coming from organic or direct. And then you look at Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, industry websites, et cetera, are still kind of just falling into that little 25% gap. And then there's a really interesting Spot Toro study from January this year, which I'm looking at now. And this is heavily um, North American skewed, but it looked at the 150 biggest referring sites online and Google 63% being, which has a slightly higher market share in the States was 7%. So 70% of traffic was being driven by those two channels. And then you look at YouTube, Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, all the, all the next 150 biggest are still only making up about 25%. So if you want traffic to your website. Google and in Australia, Google has about, what is it? 95% of market yeah. share that Google in Australia is the way to get traffic to your sites. And I think there's so much, um, noise is the wrong word because it, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn play still have huge roles to play in a buyer journey. But if you actually want traffic to your site, kind of Google, and there's an extension of that SEO is the way to do it. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I also think it really benefits some of the other services. So if you are doing organic social, or if you are doing paid per click, then SEO is a really good um, thing to do on top of that, to benefit those areas. And that's kind of SEO being the kind of foundation and you build on it with the other services. So an example of that is if you're ranking very well on SEO, it means you can spend less bidding on those terms. 
but you still have the benefit of PPC where you can get those quick wins and see immediate traffic growth by investing immediately, where SEO does have a bit of a longer time to market to see those conversions. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it'd be good to talk um, the impact of the generative AI platforms and search because it's we hear conflicting things. I think like 12 months ago, if we were doing this pod and listening to what certain people on LinkedIn were saying, it'd be very much that ChatGPT will kill Google. Um, we will turn to AI bots to get the answers to things that we once turned to. I can see Joe smiling here. Um, we've got more data now, which I think is interesting to, to kind of, to, to make better decisions on that. Like, I guess, what have, what have you seen out there more macro? And I think it'd be good to talk about the, um, the data study, which um, came out, I've got it in front of me now, but came out kind of recently. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, first off, yeah, I still have a job. So yeah, I haven't <laughs> taken that, that away yet. Um, I think a lot of what is happening in the kind of AI space is very similar to how you would optimize the SEO anyway. I think at the moment, it's also a very small percent of traffic. So it obviously launched in the US um, what's called SGE, and now it's renamed to AI Overviews. At the moment, it's only appearing for around 12% of searches. And the searches that bring in an AI overview um, are around five words. So it's really more the longer tail question terms and less of the commercial intent. So for example, what is the difference between SEO and PPC? You would get an answer for that. But if you were searching for SEO services in Sydney, you're still seeing the standard mm. SEO results that you would usually yeah, that's it. I think like the first part is Google has traffic to google.com, google.com.au has increased over the past 12 months, not decreased. Um, there has been an, a bigger increase in traffic to places like ChatGPT and perplexity, but the comparison is just wild. Like Google is just still the absolute behemoth. Um, and then it was quite interesting. The study, and it's, it's worth looking up if, if this is something you're interested in, in your business, but essentially I think perplexity was the second biggest chatbot in terms of AI type queries in, in the study that they looked at and Google had more than 290 times the number of search users as perplexity in the month of May, 2024. Um, and compared to Google's 200 events searches per search per month. So it's kind of perplexity is looking at 15. So even like the number of people. The number of searches in those AI platforms is so diminished and so small compared to the number of searches that people are still doing in Google. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, and I feel like if anything, just more and more people are going to search engines once this information becomes more accessible, questions you wouldn't usually look into a search engine for, people are doing it and more on the fly, which is increasing those searches. I think going back to the SEO kind of part of the AI overviews, a really interesting study was released recently and the correlation between what appears in AI overviews and what appears in the top 10 positions of Google has about a 99% correlation. Yeah. So I think about what that means to your business, right? Is if you're ranking well on Google anyway, you're going to appear in those AI overviews much more frequently. And that's what I've, we've seen. Like I was playing around with a client, um, client's returns who ranked really well in a particular um, vertical. And I was doing searches in ChatGPT and Gemini, very similar to commercial, and they were kind of dominant there. And same thing as Rocket, I was preparing a webinar and I was actually going to play around with what's the best digital agency in Sydney that's won a war, blah, blah, blah. And I was, we were ranking, it were coming up first or second or third. And they were very similar mix of agencies to the ones that would normally rank organically were coming up in the, the chatbot. So yeah, my feeling on that is, is that if you, if you try to bet on the fact that Google's going to lose its position as the behemoth of the industry. Um, you're probably going to be wrong, but even if you're right, we're years away from that taking place. And at present, Google is the place that moves traffic around the web every day in Australia. So I kind of think the, the, um, the importance of the channel for anything that us as marketers can control in the foreseeable future is not going to change. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree. And I'd also say, even if Google did become a less like a dominant player, so search GPT launched last month and we have some initial data on that. It's very much in beta testing. So only 10,000 people have access, but that is returning results 73% similar to Bing, which in turn is very similar to Google. So even the results in search GPT, um, yeah, are returning very similar data. I think as well, it's a lot less advanced of Google, like especially for e-commerce, it doesn't have shopping, 
It has no kind of user flow on, so you can't go into there and look at people also search. It's really just like kind of one result that you get with the listings. Yeah, that's it. And it's kind of, Google has spent the best part of 25 years creating the most phenomenal search engine we could imagine, right? And billions of users worldwide becoming accustomed to using it. Um, they've got more AI smarts, more AI engineers than ChatGPT do have. Um, and they've, they've, they've sat on the technology, not being able to roll it out because of kind of safety and, um, other issues that big companies kind of, um, have to take seriously and smaller startups can kind of roll out. So yeah, I think the, the idea that, um, Google's demise anytime soon will take place. I think so, you know, a long way away from being, being fair. So let's, let's, let's jump into like, what are the big trends that I think it's, it's good for us, I think, to narrow the conversation down to Google Australia, because I think mm -hmm. if you're still listening, then you probably agree that, you know, that is the place, the, the area of importance. Um, what are, what are the big trends? Uh, I would say the trends are kind of stay the same year on year. In fact, I would say if anything, it just kind of seems to focus in, in more of the areas that Google has been pushing for the, the last period. So there was actually a, a Google leak. So we have had the most information we ever had from that leak. There was a few things that Google has been denying, such as site authority. They said there's no metric like that came out in the AI leak that there is site authority. One of the other big things that I took away from it is something called NavBoost, where Google is not only looking at the number of links, your content on the site, but it's also looking at user engagement metrics. So click-through rate and bounce rate were two of the biggest ones there. So if you are appearing in the search results, your meta descriptions, your page titles, or the kind of intent does not match and people are not clicking on it, that is a negative impact on your overall site mm -hmm. rankings. Same as if they go onto your page and it doesn't match what they're looking for, your site is very slow and they immediately bounce off, that will then have an impact. And um, I think the other big thing, what Google has always said is content is key. And that really came out in that leak. So there was some items in there such as content freshness. So how frequently are you uploading content and also your overall authority in the site. So if you take Rocket, for example, are we uploading blog posts regularly on SEO and digital marketing topics? Are we being an expert in this space? Are we releasing podcasts and sharing them on our blog? Is all of our content really supporting those service pages? So instead of Google looking for, you know, taking a page as one, it's kind of looking at the site overall and how relevant you are to those topics. Did you, um, do you think it's fair to say that when you, as an expert, when you went through that leak, that it basically just validated all the stuff you knew anyway? Yeah, there was almost nothing that was a surprise to me. There was a few like got you to Google where they have denied the existence yeah. of a lot of things and yeah. they came out. But I always thought there's no way when Google has this much click data that they're not using that as some part of their ranking algorithm. So if you take a user, for example, if it, a position one, everyone's clicking on and jumping off, it's obviously going to be an irrelevant result, right? Yeah. Yeah, I felt the same thing. Oh, we've been saying that, right, for years, that you know, UX and quality of content and bounce rates and all those things a massive role. Um, but I think, yeah, that's right. It's kind of the, the stuff that Google has repeatedly denied, but I also feel that from my perspective, it also validates, and I think the whole direction of SEO in the last seven to 10 years has in some ways moved to where Google has been saying for years, you should be where you should be headed, which is, um, don't, don't generate links for the purpose of generating links, generate links that kind of come to you naturally create awesome content that people want to engage with, um, give your site users great experience in terms of page speed, um, good UX, et cetera, and you will be rewarded in search. And I kind of feel that the Google's big enough and smart enough that kind of, you can game the system, but over time it will kind of steer you towards doing best practice. Yeah, for sure. I think the days of like really manipulating search engines uh, are gone. You do still see it sometimes. Like there's some stuff even that came out in the leak, such as uh, domain SEO. So if you had a domain that's SEO services in sydney.com.au, Google says that you're not going to rank well there, but you often see that in the search results. Yeah. There is a, a few things that you can't always kind of assume. And again, it's just always going back to the data and those terms you want to rank for and seeing how that compares. Um, but I definitely agree that Google has been saying for ages about content, content freshness, being authority in the site. Um, EEAT is, is one of the big things. And it really, if you follow those guidelines, as long as you have the basics right, you can't go wrong.
Can we talk um, EEAT just to maybe explain what it is um, and then just what your, what works and how to approach it? Sure. So it used to be just E and then they added an additional E. So it stands for expertise and experience, authoritativeness and trustworthiness. So if we take an example of that experience would be if you're a vacuum cleaner blog and you're comparing vacuum cleaners, Google wants to know that you've actually tested these vacuum cleaners you're working on. Um, instead of just, you know, the, there was a lot of affiliate sites that used to compare these products. It was very poor. They want to know you have hands-on experience. You've taken photos yourself. You've done the comparison. So you really have that experience with the product, then expertise. So you want to be seen as a kind of vacuum cleaner expert if they exist. I'm sure they do. Um, and showing that, showing an author profile, kind of giving you that social proof. I've compared X number of vacuum cleaners. This is why you should listen to me. Then authoritativeness is, are you seen as a reputable source? If you look on the social media, are people always linking back to you? Do you have a number of backlinks from cleaning blogs saying, we really recommend this based on the test done to these vacuum cleaners here. And then the last one is trustworthiness. So is your website spammy? Do you have a security certificate? Is your website fast? Is it accessible? And are users having a clean and good experience once they actually get onto your site. Yeah. And how would you, um, cause in this day and age, right? Where the vacuum cleaner one's a good example, we could get a, um, you know, an e-commerce export of every single product imaginable. You could then pump it into chat GPT or Gemini and say, compare these products and write me a description. You could kind of have that content at your disposal within an hour, I suspect for thousands of SKUs comparing them all. Like how does Google go about looking at kind of that artificially created content with no real deep analysis or study behind it versus, you know, you've got someone in a vacuum cleaner store that is genuinely comparing model X and model A and what, what, what customers like and what they don't. Yeah. Great question. Um, so there's actually been a few updates. So one of the updates in March, for example, Google's goal was to have a 40% reduction in low content quality. And I think it really goes back to what we were discussing earlier. So in your example there, if someone is just posting one or two blog posts on vacuum cleaners. Google is looking at that site as a whole and seeing how authoritative you are in that space. So it's unlikely that someone is chat GPTing 50, 60 articles with original photos, original descriptions, they have reviews and listing, et cetera, et cetera. Like it definitely can be manipulated, but if you have a website where you are selling vacuum cleaners and you're focused on that, Google could see you have the products. It can see you have content pillars on, this is the best vacuum cleaners. Following on from that, this is the best vacuum cleaners for people with pets. This is the best mobile vacuum cleaners that you are really producing a lot of content. Once new models are released, you are then doing a blog post and kind of keeping that content fresh and very relevant to your service. Yeah. And I think the, um, the, the SEO, I think industry is the wrong word. You've got a lot of, um, independent SEOs that just have game, game things for their own benefit and blog sites and review sites, affiliate sites, whatever. You, you can always keep ahead of Google for a little while, but then you see a lot of the penalties and punishments that they've been rolling out over recent years. If you push the system too hard, you will get got, and they are smart enough to work out ways to, to identify the types of things that you're talking about. There's a good study. Um, like we got a lot of, a lot of questions from our clients when ChatGPT and Gemini kind of rose in popularity early part of last year, and it was very much, well. You know, you guys create content for us. We want to have it at 10 cents on a dollar now because we know you can click a button and have it generated automatically. And we took a pretty pragmatic approach, which was we, we want to create content that's truly excellent for our clients and creating content that is literally average because it is the sum parts of all the content that's already been created through generative AI, we don't believe serves the user. And all the studies are now showing that, like Neil Patel did a really good study showing the performance of human generated content versus AI generated content in the SERPs over a six month period, back end of last year into this year. And the human generated content just outperformed the AI content massively. And whether that's because Google's really good at identifying AI content or whether to, to your first point, right, which is Google's looking at how humans are interacting with that content and starting to realize, no, nah, it's actually not good content. And then you get penalized as a result, but either way creating great content that users actually care about will, will be rewarded, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think there is room for AI in content. Like it definitely is more of a, a supportive role to help you do that research, but it really does need that human to go in 
and actually understand what the person that's going to click on this page actually wants. Going back to those ranking signals previously, an AI doesn't understand that it can create the content. It doesn't understand exactly what the searches are that are bringing people there. It doesn't understand what the competitors are doing in that space. You can feed it this data, but in my experience, it is nowhere near what you would get from human written content. I'd also tested AI content with a, a lot of these tools. So I tested about 10 of these kind of AI testing tools and I was unable to game it really, um, not recently with these new tools. So if they're able to identify it, Google definitely is. And one of the other yep. updates this year was to really tackle on that poor quality AI content. Yeah. And Google came out, uh, correct me if I'm wrong in terms of whether they've changed their position, but they came out pretty early and said, we don't care how content is created as long as it's created for the benefit of the customer. So no problem ideating, creating a draft with AI using a tool, but then actually work with that content to make sure it's genuinely valuable and useful. Is that, and that's still the, the, the case? Yeah, yeah, very much still the case. Like you want to make sure it is actually what the users want, right? Um, yeah, as we spoke about before. Nice one. Um, anything else on EEAT? I guess like for, for if you're not selling vacuum cleaners, of which I suspect that 99.9% .9 of our listeners <laughs> are not, um, but if you're running, say, professional services or if you're running e-commerce, just generally speaking, like how do you, how do you uh, approach EEAT? Yeah, I think there's a few basic things that you can do. So one is ensuring you are publishing blogs that your readers and your potential customers would actually want to see. Um, really showing you are an, an expert in that space, including author profiles is another really basic mm. one that you can do to show that. And then internally linking to all of your other pages. So Google can see your site as a whole is very focused at that side. And then just making sure you get authoritative backlinks and all of your basic SEO, like page speed, technical SEO, the foundation is laid so that you're not getting any points marked away for that. And then in terms of doing, you know, say if you have a thought leader or leaders in the business of popping out content, Google is smart enough to connect a LinkedIn profile to a person smart enough to look at accred like accreditations in the area or like how do you show um, say like from, from my profile, for instance, do I need to link to my LinkedIn profile from the rocket blog or is Google making that connection? Like how do we build up authority? Yeah, I would say it, it's not that advanced where it's really looking at like your LinkedIn to see that you are actually the person who says, I think it yeah. just really wants to know that you are a person in the industry. You have a couple of posts that they can see across their, their kind of network and you are saying why you are the expert. And then I think the article almost speaks for itself. Like it's very clear to see when it's coming from someone who actually knows the subject versus someone who's just pumped into chat GPT and, and done a bit of edits to, to make it SEO friendly and um, the depth that you go, the data you reference, et cetera. Yeah. We've talked a bit about, um, AI as it relates to like, are users going to chat GPT instead of places like Google, like are those engines, the new search engines and we've kind of parked that conversation for now. Um, and you've touched on. Google overseas, you kind of returning more AI or large language model driven content. Can we just talk a little bit more about that? So the rise of AI in search, mm -hmm. um, we kind of, we've had things rolled out in Australia, probably things have been rolled back a little bit. Like what, what, what is Google doing, um, by way of integrating AI into its search engine? Yeah. So uh, at the moment, like you said, there's no release date for Australia to get um, certain generative experience or AI overviews. So at the moment, that's not changing. Uh, where we are seeing Google is they're continually testing what they are appealing for AI overviews. So number of words are changing. There, there was an update, I think, even yesterday when they're starting to test bringing in products into that. So I think what we're going to continue to see is that getting more and more advanced. Similar to the, a few years ago when featured snippets became a thing, it started off with one or two searches, giving you a snippet. Now you have calculators embedded and they really are trying to see exactly what the user wants. So I can see it going more and more in that direction and Google really understanding what users want to see. If you are searching for e-com products, there's going to be comparisons that's going to start pulling in those listings, et cetera. Yeah. And they've, they've stated that Gemini, which is its equivalent to ChatGPT, will over time become the search engine, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think also just embedding that into Google a bit more, like whether it becomes people are only using Gemini or that gets integrated a bit better into Google as it currently states. I think for Google's to, for users to completely move away from search engines, we're quite a long way off of that. I think it's so embedded in how everyone uses the internet 
And even now ChatGPT is going out for a few years, we haven't really seen the fall in the search engines as everyone expected. But I think that time frame is going to be a bit longer than people expected. Yeah, I reckon that's right. It is like on the mobile app, for instance, I have the Google mobile app on my iPhone and you can toggle between Gemini and Google search within that app, kind of giving the best of both. Um, just to kind of, to give, I guess, practical takeaways for listeners, like, do you still, cause often we'll get, particularly if you're dealing with non-marketers or people that are less technical, kind of like, what is SEO? And you explain it and say, like, well, how do you do it? We've always broken it down into kind of that classic on-site, off-site, um, and content. That's still fundamentally how you would view it. And then you'd kind of look at those three pillars separately. Yeah, I would say I, the the only one missing there is also technical. So really like the first thing I'd ever do with a client is we want to make sure the website is in a technically sound place. If yeah. you're building a house, right, you want to make sure the foundations are set. If not, the house might still be built, but it might fall apart in a few years. So, so that is still the number one step. I also think of the technical point, page speed plays a huge importance. So Google is now using it as part of its ranking factor. But I think more importantly, if you have a slow site, the bounce rate increase um, expands massively. If you go from two to three seconds, I think it's around 32% increase that people are going to bounce. And then once you get to a five second load time, that goes all the way up to 90% chance of people bouncing. And then if you look even further into mobile users, which is increasingly becoming where people are searching, the yeah, the patience that they have is even lower. Um, but going back to your question, so, so technical is very much first, then you want to start building on content, then start looking at offsite to build up that authority. I would say the, the thing that is changing is offsite is kind of veering into digital PR. It's yep. almost being treated as separate part, um, depending on the business anyway. Let's come back to digital PR because I think it's a good, a really good area for us to talk. Maybe an impossible question to answer, but what's the most important technical offsite content? Uh, like. Assuming that technical is not inhibiting you appearing on search results, I think that is number one. If you don't show it, it's not going to work. I would say content is still number one. Um, if you do any search on Google, if you look at the page title, if you look at the content on the screen, it very much matches what the people are searching for. So yeah, I think I've had experience moving sites with zero links at all and just focusing on content and what people want. It is very niche dependent, but if I was to say one, I think content really is key. Yeah, so I saw an example of a, in Europe, it was one of the big car brands and it was basically a site that had launched that morning um, and then they got a lot of traction to it. There was no links coming into it and it was ranking first within the day um, and kind of not to at all dismiss offsite because offsite is huge in terms of Google, Joe's kind of touched on it, I guess, in terms of all the different testing that Google does, but Google runs user groups, runs panels where they'll take certain things out of um, an algorithm to see how the results perform and how people like those results. And whenever they try to take links out, the whole quality of the SERPs just fades away. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I think the Google leak confirming that how users interact with a particular page, is such a big lever now in terms of rankings that I think it is believable that you can have a site with pretty um, modest offsite if the content itself is so um, clearly working. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Can we, um, I'd love to talk about digital PR. So you're English and I, everyone, everyone that I speak to says, uh, that digital PR was, was born in the UK. Is that, is that true? First of all? Uh, yeah, that's, that's why here, I think that in the UK, it seems to be a bit ahead in terms of search. Like it's normally a couple of years ahead, at least in Australia. I actually had a previous role where I, I did a lot of digital PR. Um, and it's an area that I've seen grow massively over the past few years. And I really think it kind of goes down to, to what the internet is focusing, like how we have these viral trends. It's very much the same for businesses. If you do get an article or content that goes viral, Google is seeing you as a kind of authoritative figure in that space, and then is more likely to rank you higher. I think it also gives you the ability, like traditional link building, you might get a couple of links. With digital PR, I've seen some campaigns for, from one article. And um, depending on how you spin it, can generate two, 300 links. And then that in turn is boosting your site authority, increasing your ranking for the really competitive terms. Can we just talk, um, take a back step just quickly. Like what, what is it for, for those that haven't heard of the term before? Yeah. So I'd say it's very similar to normal PR and there's so many different forms that you could do it, but some practical examples of that would be as rocket agency 
we could create an amazing piece of content like we do. So we had the digital marketing guide in Australia, 2024 edition. This is a piece of content that the marketing team spend hours on. We look through data, we look at trends, we really build this up. And then from that, that's one part of it. But using that as an asset, we would then want to reach out to publications relevant to the space, like SEO publications, paid search publications, marketing publications, and amplify that content building relationships with journalists to actually get them to link back to this and, and seeing it as a piece of content they actually want to write about. But there's so many other forms as well. Like people do infographics, they do kind of more viral campaigns. Um, I don't know if you remember the, the card game Cards Against Humanity. They did a lot of kind of viral tactics and I think not intentionally, but that was a great link driver mm. for them. So they had one where it was like, we're going to buy a piece of the wall. So Donald Trump can't build his wall there. And that piece of content got 400 links. So I think it could come in all sides. It, it's how creative you can be and how relevant you can make it to your business. Yeah, that's it. And I think it's kind of, um, I've got friends that own PR agencies and it's kind of having seen how things have converged over the last 15 years where I think. And I think when we're talking about PR here, we're talking very much about the element of PR that relates to getting um, articles published with publishers and news outlets, as opposed to other elements. But you see kind of PR as mainstream press has kind of digitalized and the newspaper doesn't matter as much anymore. Online reputation management, the, the role of PR to kind of shape how a brand is perceived online is such, is such a bigger part of that industry now. I mean, if you look at SEO, where everything we've just talked about in the first part of the pod is all about how you can kind of build up your perception of your brand within Google, who's got such an incredible ability of understanding what online looks like. It's just natural that those two kind of factors are coming together. Um, and I guess, and now like we're talking in the office recently about the, the, um, the, an insurer where you've got just access to so many different data points, right? And you can actually start to put together content ideas of the least insurable suburbs, the most insurable suburbs, car crash information, burglaries, whatever else. And you can see how there'd be so many publishers out there if you can create interesting content that is actually interesting to readers um, and just work your backlinks back into that to get um, references back through. Yeah. And I think, again, it all starts with the user, right? Like out of that data, what does the user actually want to see? And then being creative with how you spin it. So if you're using a car insurance, for example, you could target drivers you could then do a bit more of a kind of social media viral campaign where it's like, these are the worst drivers in what suburb has the worst drivers in Australia. And that kind of gets that more general appeal picked up by the bigger news publications like Sydney Morning Herald uh, and some of the bigger news ones or, or more viral websites. Yep. What's your perspective on whether unlinked brand mentions help for SEO? Like does Google, is Google smart enough to know that references to rocket agency on industry news sites that don't link back to us is a positive thing. Um, or are they, and are they smart enough to know that if we do get a link, but it's a no follow link, does it actually still benefit our SEO? Yeah. So there's been a few things that have come out about that, that no follow and sponsored links still have some carry through. I haven't really seen any compelling studies that convince me one way or the other. I think I would assume there is some flow on effect. If you are mentioned everywhere, like Tesla, for example, are always in the news, Google is crawling these pages and seeing it and the kind of contextual relevance and building up that authority there. But then there are some brands that have such a general name, like even taking rocket as example, how do they know they're talking about rocket agency versus a rocket spaceship? Mm. So I think there, there's a great task you can do, which is unlinked brand mentions, which I think still has, where you actually reach out and get the link. I would say that's a sure way of knowing that Google is going to register that and push it back to your brand. Yeah. Fair, fair comment. Um, I now want to steer the conversation into, I guess that interaction of SEO with PPC, we kind of talked before, before recording about it. Um, like, I guess like, what is the interplay now? Yeah. So I think I often see, and then you see as well, like coming into rocket SEO is very much an afterthought. So brands will come to us and they want us to help with the PPC strategy. And they're like, oh, you guys offer SEO. Can you help us with this? Well, I see SEO as kind of being that first step that you do. There's a lot of quick wins that we can have on SEO, even if it is a longer driver and paid search often has quick wins across even more competitive terms. So bringing them together, you kind of get the best of both worlds. You're building up your overall site authority to start ranking for these competitive terms, but then you have paid search to really drive and get instant results. 
I think once you go into the more granular details as well, if we're bidding on the term SEO agency in Sydney, that's going to be a very expensive term. As we know, the conversion rate is higher for SEO. So we're spending more to get the, the paid listing there. Once we get that to position one in Google, we get double the conversion if they come through bar SEO mm. and we're saving a lot of money on people clicking on that. And then we can put the money into terms where we don't perform as well. Yeah. What's on? Um, because I guess, you know, as the SEO guy, I'm sure you've, you've been in lots of meetings where the PPC guy comes in and starts bidding on brand and siphoning off uh, conversions that you otherwise would have had. Like what, um, I think at Rocket for us, we've got a very much, it depends um, perspective on brand bidding within um, our paid media teams. But I guess from the SEO viewpoint, like how would you be, the listeners out there, they're like, we just don't know if we should be bidding on our brand in PPC. Uh, are we just stealing leads that would otherwise have come to us organically? Like how do you... How do you make decisions on that? Yeah. Well, first off, it sucks when we report to clients and, and the first time they're not bad because <laughs> you see a huge drop in uh, SEO traffic. Uh, but I think aside from that, the best way is to just test it. Brand bidding is normally much cheaper than these terms. And if competitors are bidding, you probably do want your brand there. But if you test your brand, you see your SEO results, the branded terms or your clicks to be branded terms reduced you can then compare how much of these branded terms increase those clicks. So if we are bidding on Rocket Agency and SEO has dropped 1,000 clicks, have we received 1,500 clicks to that brand? Like, I think that is the ideal scenario to just test and see if it is worth that cost of investment. Yeah, I agree. But I've got a strong feeling that there's very few businesses in Australia that have such complex SEO or paid search requirements that they shouldn't have, if, if they are using agency partners, I think they should use an agency partner for both. I really feel strongly that otherwise not having those two channels being overseen at the top level from someone with the same interest is often very detrimental. And if you do have a different set of hands looking after you paid versus your organic, you're often kind of just in complete conflict. I think you do need to have something that sits in between to make sure that strategically you're making the right call as to how the channels relate. I um, mean, in-house and similarly again, right? As long as you've got someone in your organization that knows d deeply how those channels do integrate together. Cause I think often you will find you're running, it's just this inherent conflict of interest. If you've got separate organizations running each of those. Yeah, I'd hundred percent agree. I think having the person to oversee all of it. So Rocket, we obviously have an account manager that would look at the paid search and SEO channels and figure out how they can work best to, to reach that user's goals. I think the other benefit as well is like, I will often see in the office where a paid specialist and an SEO specialist who work on the same account will go over to each other's desk and kind of share ideas and data points. So if we are suddenly ranking really well for a term, do we want to try and turn that off? The paid search can obviously test things a lot better than we can. So if they know certain things are driving users more, we can then try and integrate that into our SEO strategy as well. Yeah, couldn't agree more. In terms of where um, where SEO is going, and I don't like to go too far into the future because I do feel that for most listeners and even for ourselves, like winning the quarter is more important than guessing where things go in five years' time. But I think you do want to forward plan and have, you know, where are we going in the next year or so? What are you seeing with things like voice search and video search? Just so that I guess marketers can start thinking of, of where those um, pieces of technology are going. Yeah, so, so voice search is definitely increasing. I think I saw a study and it's 30% of users used voice search of some degree. I think once uh, AI really uplifts, like if you've tried the GPT app on your phone and you tried the voice mode, like it's excellent. So I can only see that increasing more. But again, once we look at the data of what's actually performing in voice search, a lot of it correlates directly with what's appearing in the search result, especially what appears on kind of the structured data, the knowledge graph, uh, the featured snippet type thing and AI overview. So if you're appearing there, that's likely to be what Google is pulling from those search results. And we saw the correlation between chat GPT, Google and Bing earlier. So I think that will be similar. There's other things now like image search. So there's Google lens on your phone where you can kind of highlight the image and, and search for that. I think image SEO optimization is kind of a thing that is one of the last things you do because it's quite a lot of effort and little gain. But I would say with image search increasing, that is something that business owners want to be more diligent on. So making sure you have very high quality images that are original, making sure the file names and alt tags are optimized to that image, I think will become more and more important. 
And in the kind of a future of SEO, I think we're just going to continue seeing where it's going. So content is going to play more of an important role. Looking at a site's authority and expertise is going to be more and more important and ensuring you are kind of AI ready so that your content is written well, that anyone can understand. You're matching the search's query and people landing on the page actually getting what they want. There's a few other things as well. So when I was testing the AI overviews, people, when you are searching for a direct question, I saw a good correlation between that and the content on the page. So using mm -hmm. that example, I said earlier, SEO, how does SEO compare to paid search? If you have that as part of your content, then you're more likely to appear in those AI overviews. So really looking at the search volume data before you build out those articles and what people actually want. Great. Yeah, it does feel that the direction that search is likely going, you kind of look at, well, is it ChatGPT instead of Google or is it voice search instead of um, text-based search? The outcome is still the same where we're just the, all the things that matter for one of those is still the things that are likely to matter for the other. So just if you're focusing on those principles and doing all the things that a good SEO would have done for the last 10 years, then you, you are kind of future-proofing yourself as well. And it does feel, I, I kind of um, always think back to before Apple popularized the smartphone was always going to be, you know, the year of the smartphone or the smartphone will break through whatever else. And then eventually it happened and we never looked back. And I don't know, for the last five years, it's probably gone quiet in the last couple, but it was always voice search, voice search, the year of voice search, cars had, you know, search put into them, et cetera, et cetera. It never really took off, but it does feel that the way that we interact with chatbots, whether it's Gemini or ChatGPT, it feels that it lends itself so nicely to voice search. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. And like you said, right, we haven't really seen the pickup, which I think shows how slow people are to change their habits. Like, I think it's quite unnatural to be on a bus and using voice search and there's going to be a, a high barrier before people get there. So whenever people say this is going to be in the next year, I would usually extend that to say the next five years, especially in SEO. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of what the past has taught us, right? Uh, Joe, it's been an awesome conversation. I think before, before we end it, just any tools or resources that you recommend to marketers just to kind of, cause it is a hard space, right? I think it's a particularly difficult space because unlike a lot of other things, there's no certainty around it where I think with a lot of the areas we play in, we just know that, you know, this is what Facebook wants in terms of an ad size, or this is what will work in terms of the algorithm because the publishers or platforms tell us that, but with SEO, it always has been this kind of gray box. I think it is really challenging for for marketers where it's not your job exclusively to manage SEO, to kind of know like where to lean. So like any places you'd recommend for people that need more information? Yeah, I would say there's a, there's a lot of good beginner stuff out there. So one thing I really like is the Ahrefs have a, a great YouTube series where they publish a lot of content regularly. I think yeah. it's very digestible in short format. That's a great place to learn. I would say like if you're a smaller business owner as well, one of the best places you can look on forums such as Reddit. So like the SEO subreddit, I think a lot of things in SEO comes from experience. When you see a traffic drop, you now have to fix it. I think when you go to Reddit, you're seeing business owners experience the exact same issues you are and usually people coming up with solutions. So I think that's an area where I learned a lot about SEO. And then there's also the standard kind of search engine journal, search engine man, they will frequently publish on exactly what's happening and keeping you up to date. Um, but I would say for the standard business user, like those beginner guides are probably enough and then leaning on experts when there are these really challenging things that are happening. Yeah. Nice one. Um, Joe, I ask of every guest on the pod, what's your best piece of advice for an in-house marketer? So I feel it could be broader, it could be career driven, or it could be more specific to SEO, but yeah, what's your piece of advice? I would say the single biggest advice I would give is stick to the data. Like, I don't think the data ever lies, whether that be comparing to competitors. If the top three competitors all have a certain keyword, it's likely to mean that having that keyword is going to help you rank as well as following the other stuff, using that as an example, right? And again, is if you're actually looking at how you're performing or where you can better perform, looking back to the data will usually give you those answers and following that chain. If you see a traffic drop, where is that data coming from? And then kind of going through the analysis of why. Um, yeah, that would be my single biggest advice. Nice one, mate. Thanks so much for your time on the pod today. I think anyone that has listened would surely have one or two things that, or probably more that they can take away and implement into their SEO strategy for, for the year to come. And I think if you're, um, if you're listening and want a second opinion on your approach to SEO, feel free to reach out to us and Joe and the team can, can take a look.
Awesome. Thanks, James. Thanks, mate.